Psychological Triggers, Human Nature, Irrationality, and Why We Do What We Do, The Hidden Influences Behind Our Actions, Thoughts, and Behaviors. Understand Your Brain Better, written by Peter Hollins, narrated by Russell Newton. In general, we feel some kind of emotion 24 hours a day. We may even be aware when we're feeling emotions, at least in a physiological sense, our hearts flutter, our stomachs sink, our hands tingle. Humans are emotional beings. It's part of life. But it's criminally easy for that arousal to extend into a second phase that's uncontrollable and risky. That's when extreme emotional arousal sets off our psychological triggers. These moments are marked by elevated physiological signs and anxiety or excitement. This activity can be extraordinarily potent and potentially unsafe to ourselves and those around us. Uncontrolled, unconscious, and exaggerated emotional reactions can take on a life of their own. Intense emotions that can be either positive or negative include love, fear, anger, and curiosity. In small doses, these feelings are a normal part of the human experience, but any of those can overpower our self-control and cause us to act in a thoughtless way like excess energy or pressure that needs to be discharged. How might even curiosity be negative? How about the impulse of curiosity causing you to embark in extremely risky and dangerous behavior, such as experimenting with illegal drugs? We generally receive stimulation through our senses, sight, sound, smell, touch, or taste. When we perceive a stimulus that arouses us, chemicals released by the body flow into the brain. The chemicals animate emotional response via our amygdala while decreasing the function of our prefrontal cortex, which controls our rational, measured, analytical thinking. We then hold less control over conscious responses, and the body experiences physical unrest and prepares itself to go into battle. The well-known flight-or-fight response is an example of this kind of emotional stimulation. It's a stage in which one experiences extreme emotional and physical arousal. Some of us are endowed with arousal responses that are constantly vigilant. Seemingly anything can push these folks into red alert situations in which they scream, run, cry, get angry, or accuse others. Others don't get their buttons pushed as easily and need a stronger stimulus to activate their emotional arousal responses. Depending on which profile a person fits, they process their decision to fight or flee accordingly. The more stimulation we receive, the more aroused we get. Being in a state of arousal may seem exciting on paper, but it also causes our reason and ability to act logically to go haywire. We make decisions based on what's happening right now, strictly in response to the emotions that we're feeling. These emotions make it seem as if they represent reality rather than just a temporary state of mind. For our purposes, they are reality, and we can only operate within the reality we currently feel. In that state of irrationality, we instinctively want to boost positive emotions and cut negative ones in a desperate manner. Our brain is usually removed from this decision altogether. Survival Instincts Emotional arousal, when described this way, can seem like a bit of a design flaw in human beings. To the contrary, our emotions are a part of our evolutionary biology and fundamental to our survival instincts. Our instincts, including and most especially our fight-or-flight response, evolved over time to keep us safe. This is our inbuilt biological response to threat or danger in the environment, and our emotions are a part of it. These are powerful forces and they can absolutely influence us to behave in certain ways. In a stressful or dangerous situation, the hypothalamus is engaged and stimulated to release chemical messengers, hormones, throughout the body to signal the need to respond to the situation at hand. Adrenaline is a key hormone and gets our heart racing, blood pumping, and senses on hyper alert. All of this prepares us to act toward our survival. This process certainly has its uses, but anyone who suffers from an anxiety disorder as just one example, will know that these mechanisms can also malfunction. These evolved survival instincts are not just about keeping us away from danger. 
they're about survival in general, and that also includes our choice of mate. Who we find attractive may be a far more unconscious and physiological process than we give it credit for. The BBC once produced a show in conjunction with Newcastle University, ultimately demonstrating how people really choose their partners based on scent. The idea is that we have evolved the ability to unconsciously detect those partners who are most likely to be good genetic matches for us with an immune system that's complementary to our own so that we have the healthiest possible offspring. The BBC study found that men were most attracted to the smell of the worn t-shirts of women who had the most dissimilar immune system types from themselves. They concluded that where survival is concerned, human beings have evolved powerful instincts and impulses that drive their behavior, even if you might think your attraction is because your date is good-looking and intelligent. What does all this tell us about emotional arousal? Well, emotional arousal and our own inbuilt, evolution-acquired survival instincts may have a lot in common. They can both act as triggers for our behavior in one way or another, and in many cases, they may appear as one and the same thing. It starts with our sense perceptions, sight, sounds, etc., and our learnt responses to them. There is a neurological component as certain brain regions are engaged, and these correspond to certain emotional states that cause us to respond and act in specific ways. Most of us in the modern world are unlikely to face routine immediate threats to our survival, but we nevertheless still possess the same fight-or-flight brain mechanisms. Your body will release adrenaline in response to a perceived threat. That could be a dirty look from your boss, a bill in the mail, or some vague worry keeping you up late at night. Your body responds physically in the same way it would to a physical threat. Knowing all this about how we have evolved as human beings and the inherited physiological machinery we're all working with, we can make intelligent and informed decisions for ourselves. There's nothing inherently wrong with emotion or with the fight-or-flight response or with these unconscious impulsive reactions. But that doesn't mean we need to be at their mercy either. The trouble comes in getting carried away with emotion and evolved physiological processes in a way that never gives our higher rational selves a chance to weigh in for our own benefit. When we understand that our own biology could be acting as a trigger for certain psychological states and unwanted behavior, we can start to take conscious control. Be glad that your body works as it does. Your fight-or-flight response will kick in when you need it most, i.e., when there simply isn't time to mill over the most rational course of action. Adrenaline is almost a miracle chemical. It helps us feel less pain gives us a boost of strength and energy, and heightens our senses, allowing us to act at full capacity. But that doesn't mean you can let this unconscious, more animal side of your nature run the show 24-7. Let's return to those potent emotions, love and fear. We now know that part of what makes them so powerful and irresistible is that they're programmed in our very bodies, and have been a part of our makeup since the dawn of our species. If you meet someone one day, you may have a love-at-first-sight moment where all at once you're hit with a flood of strong, positive emotions for this person. Unaware that what you are experiencing is a heady cocktail of hormones, endorphins, and, yes, adrenaline, you go along with your obsession, chemically and neurochemically frothed up into strong emotions we all recognize as infatuation, chemistry, lust, a crush, or full-on love. Sure, your immune systems may be highly compatible, and there's something about the pheromones this stranger is sending off that makes them seem almost irresistible. This causes you to completely overlook all the information that your more rational self would pay more attention to. You have a 20-year age gap. They don't properly speak your language. They don't have a job. And, oh, you're also married. Many people can even get addicted to these feelings of infatuation in the way others get hooked on the thrill they get from extreme sports. What's happening is that evolution has designed a physiological mechanism that's somewhat effective, but nowhere near a replacement for self-discipline, rational thought, logic, or critical thinking. 
Unless this person deliberately stops and sees their emotional arousal for what it is, they will never give themselves the chance to let their higher minds step in. Another example is fear. A man may decide that making necessary changes in his life is simply too frightening, and so he holds off, never reaching his potential, never challenging himself. His body knee-jerk fear response may well have served his ancestors well, but the same thing that helped them survive in the past may ironically hinder him. That is, until he can understand what is happening and deliberately work with his psychological triggers rather than simply being at their mercy. Again, the goal is not to become an emotionless robot. Emotions are a normal and valuable part of life. However, being older and more entrenched, evolutionarily speaking, emotions leap to the fore, while our more recently developed rational mind lags behind. If we ever hope to gain self-mastery, to understand ourselves, and to strengthen our will and efficacy in life, we need to learn how to see emotions for what they are, and make sure our rational selves are getting a say in things too. Because although survival may have looked like one thing to our ancient ancestors, for the modern human being, survival also means self-awareness, responsibility, and emotional regulation. The Six Basic Emotions It's almost impossible to prevent emotions from being a part of our daily lives. It is, however, possible to keep them in a certain level of check. Since emotional responses arrive without much warning, it's beneficial to get familiar with them so we can mitigate the effects they have on us and those around us. Recognizing these effects when they hit gives us a greater ability to control ourselves and our behaviors. Let's attempt to understand how they manifest and how to short-circuit that process. In 1976, Paul Ekman, a highly influential psychologist from the University of California at San Francisco, developed a list of six universal emotions, along with the specific facial expressions that display them. One emotion is positive, four are negative, and one can be either. Happiness, sadness, anger, disgust, fear, surprise. Various other studies have yielded different numbers of emotions, ranging from four to seven, but for our purposes, six is sufficient. You may have even been surprised to see surprise and disgust categorized as emotions. Remember that emotions are normal and healthy, but over-arousal can lead to regrettable behavior and decisions. Happiness. A state of emotional peace and fulfillment. Happiness is the primary goal for pretty much all of us. Neurochemically, happiness is associated with endorphins, serotonin, dopamine, and oxytocin. This is the emotional state that has us feeling open and responsive to the world, hopeful, optimistic, and warm. Happiness can trigger us to act generously, to take risks and face our fears, to reach out to others socially, to create, to explore, or simply to celebrate. Once we attain happiness, we work to keep it going by recreating it as much as we can. We ride that roller coaster five times in a row. We go to that day spa again, and we return to the same bar where all our friends hang out and laugh. But there's a breaking point where even these positive emotions can produce negative outcomes. When our emotional arousal is so intense, our pursuit of unhappiness can turn irrational, dangerous, overindulgent, and unhealthy. This is when we turn into hedonists and forsake all else for pleasure and happiness. For instance, drug addiction, developing a dark narcissism about our appearance, having drinking problems. Sadness. Despair, depression, grief, and loss are, unfortunately, extraordinarily powerful emotions that produce some of the most troublesome states of mind. They can trigger frightening conditions of hopelessness, and efforts to emotionally lubricate oneself. When we're feeling sad, it's as though we shut down and close off to the world. We no longer seek to explore, take chances, ask questions, or express ourselves. We're pessimistic and interpret things negatively and shy away from others, trapped in the certainty that we know it will all work out badly. Being sad, we may not feel resilient or confident in ourselves, 
there simply seems to be no point to anything. We may be triggered to numb ourselves down, to escape, to blame others, to retreat into denial, or even a secondary emotion like anger. The breakup of a relationship, the death of a loved one, the loss of a job, or tragic turns in world events can release waves of sadness. When we get too sad, we get triggered to escape or abbreviate the experience as soon as possible, whether through denial, substance abuse, or withdrawal from public life. The worst cases can lead to harming oneself or taking one's own life. Anger. Anger is a more wrathful, more malicious negative emotion than sadness. Anger can be a product of many of the same events as sadness, breakup, death, job loss, and so forth. But where sadness infers a lessening or loss of our stature or being, anger makes us seek justice or vengeance for wrongs to be righted or for someone to pay. We want someone to pay, and we want it right now. Of all the emotions, perhaps anger is the most likely to trigger real-world action. While anger at a genuine slight can help us to act to reaffirm our boundaries and defend ourselves, some anger is irrational and destructive. Anger can trigger all sorts of narratives and justifications to explain why someone deserves our wrath and can energize us to start making plans, even if they're not the best thought through or well-intentioned plans. Anger speaks more directly to offenses to our ego, which prompts a more energetic response. It can trigger desires for revenge, retribution, or destruction. Anger is more easily projected than sadness. An angry person is more likely to find external targets for their efforts. When we're overly angry, we're triggered to scream out loud, pound our fists in a wall, or throw a flower vase across the room. We might even create elaborate vengeance schemes instead of dwelling in internal misery. An angry person might act out their destructive tendencies on other people or objects. Disgust Disgust can be hard to tell apart from anger. Generally speaking, disgust happens when we get offended by something in some way. It doesn't need to be directed at us. It's just a feeling of offense and disturbance by something we perceive. We feel disgusted when we smell a carton of spoiled milk, or when someone tells a racist joke, or when we see someone being pushed into a puddle of mud. We deal with disgust more indirectly than we deal with anger. We still want to rectify the situation as quickly as possible. We want someone to answer for creating a disgusting and offensive situation, or we want the situation pushed out of sight immediately. If someone's moral failings disgust us, we usually complain to someone else about it as opposed to the person who's disgusting us. If it's a physical disgust, something that smells or looks bad, we throw it out and clean up as much as we can. Disgust can especially trigger traits and actions associated with obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD. Fear. We covered how fear can take control of your brain in the last chapter. When we perceive threats to our being or happiness, we can get triggered into developing full-fledged phobias. When we're too deep in fear, we just want to make it stop. This can make us completely paralyzed or throw us into violent, immediate action to make our anxiety cease. Fear can trigger a range of behaviors, avoiding the situation, getting obsessed with it, blowing things out of proportion, feeling paralyzed or numb, failing to act, becoming confused, or even blaming others or looking to them to rescue you. Surprise. This, of course, is the immediate occurrence of the unexpected, either positive or negative. Really, it can cause any of the other emotions to develop to their fullest extent. Surprise is arguably the most volatile of these emotions because of its suddenness. When we're overly surprised, we're triggered to react in shock. Afterward, the brain then quickly analyzes the situation to decide whether it's a good shock or a bad one. Shock can make us respond in any number of ways and is the least predictable of emotions. It happens when someone having a birthday opens the door on a surprise party, or when somebody looks at their bank statement and sees a bunch of withdrawals they didn't authorize. Surprise seizes our cognition and drastically reorients our attention. 
Our triggered reactions can include a dropped jaw, raised eyebrows, or an outburst of expletives. In the more medium term, surprise can morph into another emotion or trigger us to act in defensive or panicked ways if the surprise was unpleasant. As you can see, too much of any emotion in one way or another demands quick strong action to further a pleasurable emotion or subdue a painful one. And, as we know by now, quick strong action does not typically lead to smart decisions. This has been Psychological Triggers, Human Nature, Irrationality, and Why We Do What We Do, The Hidden Influences Behind Our Actions, Thoughts, and Behaviors, Understand Your Brain Better, written by Peter Hollins, narrated by Russell Newton, copyright 2020 by Peter Hollins, production copyright by Peter Hollins.